Hello, I'm Marshall Shore, Arizona's hip historian. Today I'm joined by the Arizona State Capitol because it was recently proclaimed online to be the ugliest state capitol in America. How did that make you feel? It makes me feel mad and upset. I'm over 115 years old, older than the state itself, and those folks at that list took a pic of my bum and called it ugly. Though I've had some work done, I don't feel that they were correct nor very polite. You know, Capital, you're looking quite dapper today. <laughs> well, thank you, hip historian. I'm a humble Capital, nothing too fancy. I'm all about local. My foundation that keeps me standing here was carved from our own nearby landmark, Camelback Mountain. My top came from Yavapai County, and the ground level is granite from South Mountain. But I have to boast about my copper top. It was old and dinged up. The wonderful youth across Arizona saved their pennies to buy me a new shiny copper dome. <laughs> Thank you. Who's with you today? My children, the House and Senate. See, Arizona has grown a lot over the years. Instead of moving or getting rid of me and getting something new and fancy, they were added as needed. Some call them too modern, lacking class, but they are children of their era and show how we've grown since my territorial days. Do you like it when people come to visit? Oh, of course. I adore visitors. We're the home by and for the people. You can even get a tour of all four floors and hear the stories that make Arizona's history great. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us again this evening for another exciting Arizona Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. Can you believe this is already the end of January? I am Brenda Holt, the Associate State Director of Community Outreach and Advocacy for the Arizona State Office of AARP. I'd like to welcome you tonight. So, you know, this month we've been talking a lot about the fresh start and um, jobs. And so this will be the last session uh, that I will uh, come to you and, and speak about a work and jobs for the month. But you can always find us at aarp.org slash phoenix, aarp.org slash near you. And if you're looking for a job, www.aarp slash work. So I'm not going to hold up things any longer. Let's get to tonight's exciting event where Marshall, I'm sure, is going to bring us some exciting trivia and things that we did not know about the rich history in the state of Arizona. Enjoy tonight. Well, hello and good evening, everybody. I'm so excited that you've been able to join us. Hopefully you're in some place where it's nice and warm and cozy. Ah, uh, have we got such a great show this evening? Oh, just you wait. Now on this chilly day of January 28th here in now, we are in 2021. I know we've got folks out there on YouTube, some folks on Twitch and some of you on Facebook. So I want to say welcome to all of you. I'm so happy you're here, that you've taken time out of your busy day to join us as we get a chance to jaunt through some Arizona history. Now, what can you expect? Well, you know, we're going to do a little bit of show and tell in a little bit. We also have some amazing trivia with our guest, Peter, as well as Little Arizona, where we get a chance to explore a small town in Arizona, as well as some music history. So you might wonder, 
If this is your first time here, you might wonder, who is that man on my screen and why is he there? Well, about 21 years ago, I was working in a library in Brooklyn. And, you know, I had decided that because of the snow, that I was going to leave this lovely Carnegie Library that I was working at. And I traded that for a library in South Phoenix. Now, to do that, we had to load everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And, you know, they had their world and international headquarters right here in the Valley of the Sun. Helping all those people who have been moving here and are still moving here as we speak. Now, when we got here, we moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. Now, when we moved in, it was oh so many tones of beige. I'm happy to say now it is a much more simplified two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. Now, pretty much the house is a time capsule. Why, that's what my kitchen looks like still to this day. All the original cabinetry, all the original cooking things. I don't know. Implement, not implements, I guess, equipment. So you've got that lovely buttercream yellow tile with the matching stove top and that in the wall oven. They still all work like a charm. In fact, I use that stove top every day to make myself a cup of coffee. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, either on foot on bike or in my car, I kept coming across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And then you've got that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, you know, people are still moving here in huge numbers. So I also am called the hip historian. You might wonder, how does one get a name like the hip historian? Well, you know, every year on February 14th, Arizona celebrates itself, Statehood Day. And back in 2012, we celebrated 100 years of statehood. And there were events across the state and on that February 14th of 2012, right in front of the Capitol, they had a main stage and all kinds of fun things going on. And they gave me 15 minutes to talk about anything I wanted to. And I chose to talk about my most favorite events called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It ran from 1926 to 1955. It was touted right there with Mardi Gras as something that everybody in the country should go and see. And many people did go and see it. Why, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing in it. And I was lucky enough to find three dresses from the 30s in a box. And so I had convinced three amazing friends to put those dresses on, wander around the stage as we talked about Mask of the Yellow Moon and some of its amazing history. And, you know, lectures like that, as well as other things, that's kind of what I was doing up until early last year and suddenly found myself having to shift gears. No longer were was I doing tours, no longer were the lectures happening. Lots of things were canceled. And so this kind of cropped out of that, that whole idea of, you know, sharing stories with people and then they share their stories back. Now I am happy to say that we are doing every second Saturday, we are doing a walking tour of downtown where my co-host Deb and I are completely masked. We actually wear microphones. And so all the, all the participants, which are only 10, everybody's wearing a mask. We're all outside and socially distanced. And we get a chance to go explore downtown, which has been a lot of fun. Now I know the February tour is sold out. So the next tickets we have available are gonna be March 13th. So if during this, you would like to reach out or after the show, I know several of you have chat over on the side of your screen. Feel free to write messages in there and utilize that. Um, after the fact, you can also reach out to me on Facebook, which is Marshall Shore Hip Historian, as well as Instagram, Hip Historian, or even good old fashioned email, hello at hiphistorian.com.
Now, if you're watching on Facebook, I will ask you to click on that. There's a little button beneath that says share. If you click on that and it's going to the public, everybody who sees your page is going to get a chance to see all the amazing fun we're going to have tonight. So many stories. So go ahead and click on that. Now we're getting ready for some show and tell because, you know, you saw a photo of my house inside. I've got some stuff. And so I always like to just kind of pull things off and randomly highlight them. And so whenever you ever go to Disneyland, I've got some friends who are so sad that Disneyland is closed. Not like they're going to go anytime soon. But when you look at Disneyland, one of the f iconic things about it is Sleeping Beauty's castle. And so that castle was actually designed by Roland Hill. And so I have a lovely little Disneyland salt and pepper shaker that is in, oh, trying to figure out which direction to go. So you can see it is indeed Sleeping Beauty's castle. A little salt and pepper shaker, even on a cute little tray that, oh, you can't, oh, there you go. Even tells so in case you forget where you got it from, it reminds you that it came from Disneyland. And so Roland Hill designed that. And, you know, his son now lives in Casa Grande and has his own private museum, which is full of all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I was able to tour it last year. And it was so much fun to go wandering through his collection. So, all right. So it would not be a happy uh, Arizona history happy hour unless we had a cocktail. And I am so happy to say that PJ from the Hotel Valley Ho is kind of my cocktail ambassador. And so every week creates a cocktail that tells an Arizona story. And this will be no exception. So for this, he has created the Jingle Float. Now he knows how I love to have to put things together. And he's really kind of trying me this week because um, I could make a huge mess. We shall see how this goes. But let's go ahead and go to the bar. And so basically it's called the Jingle Float because Jingles was one of... Andy Devine's characters, and you'll find out why that's important in just a little bit. And so it has, it starts off with a Kalamazoo stout. Oh, it helps if you take the bottle cap off. Oh my gosh, look at that beautiful color. All right. So while that is, the head is coming down. Now, he really chose that as kind of a way to honor Anna Devine's father. And then because we're in the middle of winter and there's lots of snow cap on the mountain, this indeed does get a cap of ice cream on top of it. Wow, he measured that perfectly. It fits right in. Now, we're coming up to the part that could be rather messy. Or I wouldn't say dangerous, but I would say opportunity for <laughs> me to make a mess. So he has made an Irish cream whipped cream. So this is made with, you've got a whiskey in here. I mean, so he chose to really honor the Duke bourbon, which is made in here. And so, and that is really showing that Anna Devine's granddad was an Irish immigrant, as well as he starred along John Wayne in s movies right here in Arizona. So let's see what happens. Oh, it didn't make a big mess. Oh, look at that. Oh, maybe I spoke too soon. Oh, that's everything submerging. All right. So there we have a jingle float. So cheers, everybody. A nice little frosty drink for uh, chili. 
day in Arizona. Oh, and also my background is important later on. So you'll definitely want to stick around for that and just wait because there's Arizona history throughout all of this, including our last segment, Little Arizona. So one of the fun things I get to do is I always ask guests, you know, do you have a favorite musician, a favorite small town? And Peter came through swimmingly on both occasions. So, all right, so let's get rid of the bar. All right. So I am proud to bring on our special guest, Peter Corbett. Now, Peter has worked in Arizona in journalism for 35 years. He graduated from NAU, Northern Arizona University. He in, and had a stint in newspapers in Flagstaff, Verde Valley, and even the Scottsdale Progress as a reporter and then as the city editor. He also included in that is 23 years at the Phoenix Gazette, as well as the Arizona Republic. Now, like me, he's a Midwest transplant. He located to Flagstaff and actually lived along Route 66 before it was decommissioned. Now, he also did some time at the Arizona Department of Transportation, where he contributed to many blogs about history of the state highway system. And in 2015, he launched a blog called On the Road Arizona. That's a travel history. And in, he was even honored by the Phoenix New Times as the best travel blog for Arizona. So without any further ado, let's bring on our special guest. Hello, hey, Peter. How are you doing? I am good. And yourself? Great. And happy, happy hour to all your uh, hip historian fans out there. Now, I saw you raising a glass earlier. What, what, what are you well, having I, I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get the uh, a jingle float. I wish I had. It looks delicious. But I have a nice white wine, a Chardonnay. Ah, uh, very nice. So we heard a little bit about On the Road. Do you have anything else to say about yourself as kind of an intro before we launch into some history? Well, as uh, for, for uh, On the Road Arizona in the last uh, five years, I've just been traveling a tremendous amount, uh, seeing small towns, exploring uh, all the highways, to every, uh, just about every highway in the state uh, and, and federal system I've been on in Arizona. And uh, on Wednesday morning, I took a drive up to the Grand Canyon. Uh, the highways were clear and uh, just beautiful uh, snow all the way from Sunset Point North. And the Grand Canyon was just spectacular with snow. It's just, uh, it's just breathtaking. Very good. So now if you've been with us before, you'll know we do trivia, but I always like to go through and how we do trivia is a little different than how a lot of other trivias are done because our trivia is all about learning. So we have our questions that are all multiple choice. And so we'll go through those. Then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break and learn about a really cool piece of Arizona music history. And then from there, we'll go through the answers and talk about, well, why is that the answer? And kind of the story behind that. So that way, even if you don't know the answer, you take a guess at one of those multiple choices and one of them is correct. Sometimes maybe even more was one is correct. You never know. And so by the end of this, you'll be able to sit down, have a glass of your favorite beverage and chat about Arizona history that you didn't know before the evening started. All right, so let's start off. We've got our first question. And oh my gosh, Andy Devine, we just mentioned him earlier. All right. So Western char character actor Andy Devine was born in this Arizona town. A. Prescott, B. Kingman, D. Holbrook or D. Flagstaff. 
Now, which one of those towns was Andy Devine born in? Now, I forgot to say, you can keep track of your answers. You can do that in the chat. You can do it if you had, let's see, some mayonnaise and a BLT. You can keep track of it on your sandwich. Whatever makes you happy, you go right ahead and do that. Now, our second question. Now, you can tell Peter wrote these because this has a sports theme. <laughs> So, all right. So question two, how many times have these Arizona sports teams combined? Now that's an important word, combined. Suns, Cardinals, Coyotes, and Diamondbacks played in their respective league championship finals. So we know one of those is right. So is it A at two, B, which is three, C4 or D6. So, and remember, if you don't know, you can just take a random guess. All right. And very appropriate for today, actually, probably this week, is what is the coldest temperature ever recorded in Arizona? A minus 12, B minus 23, C minus 35. Or D minus 40. Good gosh. Those tempers remind me of like growing up in the Midwest. It felt like uh, it felt like minus 23 in Flagstaff today, but it was actually only 13. Oh, uh, but you know, sometimes that wind whipping through is the is the nail in the coffin on the chili factor. That's right, exactly. All right. So question four. How long did Arizona's Carl Hayden serve in Congress? A, 36 years, B, 40 years, C, 56 years, or D, 61 years. So how long did Carl Hayden serve in Congress? All right, moving on to five. How many national parks are there in Arizona? Now I'll emphasize that was national parks. So is there one, which is A, B, which is three, C, which is six, or D, for nine national parks in Arizona. And, and that doesn't count national monuments, which are uh, quite a few more. Right. And, and not state parks either, because it's national parks. Exactly. All right. Which one of these observatories is on the highest peak? A, Mount Lemon. B, Mount Graham, C, Kitt Peak, or D, Naval, Naval Observatory. So which one of those observatories is on the highest peak? All right. So question seven. What year did the college in Flagstaff become Northern Arizona University? Was that a, 1916, B, 1948, C, 1966, or D, 1971. So NAU became NAU. It was something before that, but what year did NAU get that name? Yeah, it had been um, a normal school at Flagstaff. It had been Arizona Teachers College at Flagstaff. And it actually started out as uh, it was going to be a boys reformatory school. So. Oh, wow. I never knew that. That's <laughs> quite a change from what it is today. Exactly. Well, there's plenty of uh, uh, juveniles up there who uh, need reform, I'd say, still. <laughs> I'm speaking for myself, I guess. I was going to say, and not including you, obviously. <laughs> All right. What was the highest elevation town in Arizona? Is it A, Alpine, B, Greer, C, Nutrioso, or D, Summerhaven? So which one of those towns has the highest elevation in Arizona? All right. 
So, you know, Arizona has lots of official state things. So we also have one of those have a state bird. And so which of the birds that you see around Arizona is that official state bird? Is it A, the cactus wren? B, the hummingbird? C, the roadrunner? Or D, the cardinal? Now, this is not a sports question, so we're not asking about a sports team or anything, but the official state bird. All right, question 10. What was Arizona writer Zane Gray's real first name? Was it A, Theodore? DB, Shane? C, Sherman? Or D, Pearl? What was Zane Gray's first name? And you know, we normally stop at 10, but guess what? We have some bonus questions coming up. Oh my gosh. All right. So back in 1929, Navajo Bridge was built to replace Lee's Ferry as it crossed the Colorado River. What happened to John D. Lee, who established that ferry back in 1873? A, did he retire to Ganab, Utah? B, did he, was he drowned in the river? C, executed by a firing squad? Or D, opened up a trading post? So what do you think happened to John Lee, who established Lee's Ferry? All right. And, you know, we have one more. The Cowboy Artists of America group was formed in 1965 at a tavern in what Arizona town? A. Tombstone. B. Prescott. C. Tucson. Or D. Sedona. So where was the Cowboy Arts of America where were they first formed and a tavern where? All right. So while you're all either figuring out your BLT score um, or you're going through the chat going, wait a minute, what letter was that? What number was that? All right. So we are going to take a little bit of an Arizona history music break. Now, I always love asking the guests if they have anything they would like to throw in and oh my gosh just wait till you see who peter came up with i'm peso dollar here's how you can bag the tastiest meal in town draw a bead on nk hearst ham bean <laughs> so peso dollar and his counterfeit bills so peso dollar was law enforcement by day. By night, he crooned around the Phoenix area clubs, concerts, making his way to radio and TV, as well as being the spokesperson for those ham beans. And hence why I played that commercial as well as my the screen behind me. I thought it was and the Blazing Saddles reference there, uh, Marshall. <laughs> you, have a mute, you have a mute thing, don't you? I do have a mute thing. If something happens. <laughs> Indeed, in case. What is it? There's, aren't they a musical fruit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily I had no beans today. So, but so he was around Arizona doing all kinds of things. When he passed away, his son, Mark, actually picked up and carried on the microphone. And we're actually going to try and play one of Peso Dollar's songs that commemorates an Arizona town. So now let's see if this does work. There's a town way out in Arizona. It's a place. The Hacienda River That's the only place I want to be I know that someday
So that was recorded for the Wickenburg Recording Company. He also recorded for the Wickenburg Broadcast Company. And so there's so little information out there about either of those companies. So I always like to throw it out to those folks watching because you never know what kind of history they might be holding. So that's one of the things that's like, you know, if anybody has any information on the Wickenburg Recording Company or Broadcasting Company, please let me know so that we will continue the story of Peso Dollar and his counterfeit bills. He knew his way around it with the guitar there. He played a pretty mean guitar. He did indeed. Perhaps he was good with the gun too. As a well, and I guess it was like, and so um, during World War II, he actually took his guitar with him. And so he probably had lots of time to practice while he was in war. And so that's when he came back and then became this huge sensation playing all over the place. So great tune. <laughs> in, indeed. Yeah. You know, I'd never, I'd never heard that tune before. So he had other hits as well, but I think that one was actually just kind of cool because you don't really hear necessarily hear that song that much anymore. And I just love it with that twang. All right. So now that you've been waiting patiently for some trivia questions and answers, we're almost there. All right. So question one, Western character actor Anna Devine was born in what Arizona town? Flagstaff. Now, some of you might have said Kingman. And Peter, why would they have thought Kingman? Well, he didn't live long in Flagstaff. And his family moved to Kingman. And uh, his father operated the Hotel Beale, which is still there. It's, fortunately, it's closed. It needs a major restoration. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's where he grew up. And the main street in town is called Annie Divine Boulevard. You know, and so every year um, for the new year, I always do a binge of Twilight Zone and watching along and all of a sudden up comes an episode and there is Andy Devine playing one of the characters, Frisbee, who's like a know-it-all that gets kidnapped by aliens. <laughs> so, and I was like, oh, a little bit of Arizona history, even on the Twilight Zone. All right. How many times did the Suns, Cardinals, Coyotes, Diamondbacks play in league championship finals? Four times. Now, you might have guessed four just because there were four teams. But of course, the Diamondbacks are the only ones that won a championship. So we have that. <laughs> and the Coyotes have yet to go to a championship final. Right. So, although the Suns were in it twice. We all remember that. That was heartbreaking. Both times. And even the Cardinals. Another heartbreaker. <laughs> Indeed. All right. And the coldest temperature ever recorded in Arizona? D minus 40. Oh, my gosh. Good Lord. That, I, that, you know, that is like more than snowmobile suit weather. Stay indoors weather. Yeah. And so that was at Lake Holly. And so, I mean, you can see how beautiful it was. I can just only imagine that lake with that temperature and probably that thick layer of ice going across it. All right. How long did Arizona... Carl Hayden, did he serve in Congress? And it was 56 years. C. And there's no there's no truth that, that he was named Arizona's fossil. Oh, but all, with all due respect, there at sister, a little joke there. <laughs> and so he was in the House for 14 years and then the Senate for 42 years. Oh my gosh. That was a long time to be holding leadership in Arizona. Right, and he helped us to uh, get the Central Arizona Project. That was a, a groundbreaking uh, effort on his part. And, and also his family had Hayden Mill right there on in Tempe, which still stands. Yeah, there's so many uh, place, place names of Hayden. Uh, and there's a town in Arizona called Hayden and as well as the, the roads and the uh, Hayden Ferry, was which was originally called uh, Tempe. Right. Right. And then gave way to the mill and then Mill Avenue got named for the mill. So 
His name lives on. All right, so how many national parks are there in Arizona? Three national parks. So they are the Grand Canyon, Petrified Forest, and Saguaro National Park. And uh, Marshall, there's apparently there's 22 national park units in Arizona. That includes those three national parks. I think it's 14 national monuments. And then there's historic sites that are added to that. And it comes up at 22. And that's, you know, that's a lot more than most other states have. Yeah. Now, Peter, I'm assuming you've been to all three. I have been to all three. I've been to a, all but a, a couple of the national monuments. And uh, I've been to, uh, I still have some bucket list stuff on uh to be to see more of Fort Bowie and some of the other historic sites, uh, include I uh, have been to Hubble Trading Post on the Navajo Reservation. I highly recommend that. It's beautiful uh, old trading post with a, a, a Navajo rug room. That's just incredible. Yeah, that room is beautiful. I've only been to Petrified Forest and Grand Canyon. I've yet to make it to Saguaro, so. Yeah, and the Saguaro is, is definitely worth a drive in the springtime. There's two units of it. One's on the west side of Tucson. The other was on the east side. And the, the forest on the west side is just uh, just really tall and just thick with uh, Saguaro's. It's, it's really amazing. Nice. I love all the beauty in Arizona. Uh, everywhere you go, there's something. We're blessed, yes. We are indeed. All right, so which of these observatories is on the highest peak? Mount Graham. Yeah, and it's, I believe it's 10,000 plus, so it's it's way up there and it really stands out in southeastern Arizona when you're near Safford. It's a really a spectacular mountain range. Now, is there any connection between this and someplace in Italy? I do believe that there is uh, the Vatican has interest in observatories, and I think that they have an interest in Mount Graham, or they, at least they did at one time. I know they did. I don't know if they still do or not. Right. And then, of course, there was a very big environmental uh, disagreement about developing that. Uh, there's a species of squirrel that was uh, indigenous to that area, and uh, there's quite a long fight over uh, developing it. Ah, Okay. Didn't realize the squirrel. Save the squirrels. Indeed. All right. So seven. What year did the college in Flagstaff become NAU? C, 1966. As, as I mentioned to you earlier, Marshall, they had, they were batting around lots of different names for the university when they came up with Northern Arizona University. I think they considered University of Northern Arizona but they never considered calling it Flagstaff University because you wouldn't want to have your school with the initials FU. So that was off the table. <laughs> if they had done that, the college wear would be a huge seller. That's right. And the t-shirts would go very well. They would and, sell very well. And indeed they would. All right. Question eight. What is the highest elevation in Arizona? B, which is Greer, and almost 4,800 feet. Wait, I think that's 8,300, 8, highest elevation town, 8,300 feet. Ah, yes, okay. So, yeah, that's high up there. I mean, I've, I've got friends who have summer cabins in Greer. And that's why, because it's nice and cool up at that level. Indeed. Although I know a few years ago, they, they had a, um, f the forest fires were up there. Yeah. The wallow fire burned through that area. I think it was 2011 or 12. Oh, it was devastating. The largest uh, wildfire in Arizona history, I think 530,000 acres, just heartbreaking to see. Indeed. All right. What is Arizona's official state bird? the cactus wren and i should point out that some people might have guessed the uh, the single finger salute as the arizona state bird when they're in traffic so <laughs> it's not true especially during rush hour traffic but yeah that's not the official bird that's right 
<laughs> well, it was funny because I was I was actually looking up kind of the history of this, and I guess it was a woman's group in Coolidge that first came up with that said, "Hey, you know, we want the cactus wren." And then then it became a bill, and suddenly it was law. So we now have the cactus wren as our state bird. Yeah, I wonder if they, if they did that now, there'd probably be a lot of fighting over whether there should be the roadrunner or the cardinal. It's, or even the hummingbird, all depending on where you're at in Arizona. There's a lot of fans of hummingbirds. Yeah, I mean, there's some great hummingbird sanctuaries yes. around the state, Rain, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. I like the song with the cactus wren. It's really quite endearing. All right. And what was Arizona writer Zane Gray's first name? D. Pearl. Pearl Zane Gray. Doesn't sound very macho. So I think he. I, I think he probably did a good thing dropping his first name. You know, he started out, he's a, he was a baseball player back east, and, he, and then he went, became a dentist, and started writing, and then uh, left baseball and uh, dentistry for uh, writing novels and hunting and fishing and adventures in the West, which uh, sounds a lot better than dentistry to me. It sounds a lot more interesting. I mean, he wrote over 90 books. All we all of those were Westerns. He wrote a few other books, but that was his focus, really writing Westerns. Um, Riders of the Purple Sage was his best-selling book that's been turned into multiple movies. And a few years ago, um, the Arizona Opera actually commissioned an opera based on the story, Riders of the Purple Sage. With the sets being done by Ed Mel, which was pretty amazing. He also did, uh, uh, there was a movie called Call of the Canyon, which was filmed in Oak Creek Canyon. And uh, I, I think several of those books have been turned into movies, but that's the one. That right. I yeah. I mean, right. He said several that have been turned into movies. It was just that writers was the most popular and there was the most versions. I mean, it was kind of like, it seemed like almost every decade had its writers, the purple sage for several, for several decades consecutively. So. Yeah, I did some re tried to do some research on the number of books he sold over the years. And I, what he started uh, almost a century ago writing, I believe. And it's really hard to get an, a good handle on how, just how many books he sold because he was just a, he was just a, uh, a Stephen King uh, level novelist and it just sold so many books over the years. Right. And, and so many different publishers, it's like, so the rights would be sold. And so that, that just kind of help us uh, obscure that total number just because all these different publishers are reporting and. I, sh I should also uh, think it's interesting that uh, he had a cabin on the, on the, on the rim east of Payson and, and it was burned in one of the wildfires. I can't remember. It might've been the dude fire. I'm not sure. Oh, I didn't realize his cabin burned. Yes. And then, so they rebuilt it in pace and in, uh, I think it's called green Valley park. It's, uh, west of, uh, 87 there when you get into town and it's really beautiful. They did a really nice job of restoring or it's actually a rebuilt, but I uh, used, uh, based on pictures of the original and it's definitely worth a trip up to see it. Nice. All right. And so now we normally have 10 questions, but, oh, and Carol Lee said it burned in the dude fire. So, all right. So now we're getting to some bonus questions. So back in 29, the Navajo Bridge was built and it replaced Lee's Ferry. Now, what happened to John Lee? Oh, my gosh. Executed by firing squad. He didn't walk off into the sunset. <laughs> he didn't, have a, didn't have a cozy retirement. No. So what, what happened? Well, uh, if you've ever heard of the Mountain Meadows Massacre in Southern Utah in 1857, Lee was there and there was a group of Mormons uh, in, in, uh, in Southern Utah. And they, some of them dressed up as Indians and there was a, a wagon train of people coming through. And the, uh, the Mormons are accused of slaughtering 120 people, including some women and children. And it was many years later before anybody was held accountable for it. And it turned out John Lee, John D. Lee was the only one ever held accountable. And he was found guilty and executed by a firing squad. It's quite a 
dark chapter in uh, Western history and uh, of the LDS church, especially. Yeah, and then I was going through, I actually found photos of the Navajo Bridge and even was able to find one of Lee's Ferry. All right. And so we are coming up to our last question of the night. And so the Cowboy Arts of America were formed in 1965 at a tavern in what Arizona town? D. Sedona. Yeah, the, uh, the Oak Creek Tavern in the, uh, in the 70s and early 80s when I was going to school in, in Flagstaff was a really good hopping uh, Western bar with also having country rock. And uh, Joe Beeler is one of the cowboy artists of America founders, and he, was, he lived in Sedona. And I suspect that he was the one that, uh, that brought the group there and they had their meetings and probably had a few beers and a few shots of whiskey along the way. But uh, a very important uh, group of artists that uh, have had a, a, an annual show in Phoenix for, for decades, ever since then, I believe. Right. So yeah, which is a really great show. And then just as a side note, there's a there's a Fippin Museum in, in Prescott, north of Prescott, that has cowboy art. And uh, uh, I can't think of the artist's first, first name of Fippin, but he's the one that's, uh, his name's on, the, on that museum. And I, and, I, and I was there a few years ago. I what haven't seen it. I get to see that. Yeah, what a great little museum. So that was a lot of fun. And just, I mean, and then um, it was on the other side of Prescott. So I actually got to go in through the back way, which was kind of fun to see a whole other side of Prescott than what I normally get a chance to see. Yeah. So they also, I think, have a Cowboy Hall of Fame there or some, some kind, Arizona Cowboy Hall of Fame or something. Oh. Which I'll, I never, be, I'll never be in there because I'm, even though I've lived here a long time, I'm no cowboy. I'm a city boy. <laughs> It's like you, Marshall. I was going to say, but you know, that doesn't mean that I can't go look at it. You got a cowboy hat, Marshall? Actually, I do. Good for you. <laughs> so I and I actually, I've worn it horses. a couple times. I stay away from horses. They know I'm a, a greenhorn, so I don't think toss me. It. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I, it's like the, the last time I was on a horse was doing one of the horseback rides through like South Mountain, which is very nice and leisurely and... Yeah, no one's chasing you or anything else because I would be gone if that was the case. So, all right. So how did you do? You know, I saw some people saying, you know, I didn't get many right. But, you know, the whole goal of if you got them right or not is not where the fun of tonight is. It's really in now. Now you know what those answers are. And that's the fun we do every week is it's basically storytelling. We get a chance to explore Arizona history in a whole different way through so many different lenses. Hey, Marshall, I, I just want to give a plug here. To, I worked this summer with uh, Marshall Trimble. He came out with an Arizona trivia book in 1996. And uh, I worked with him uh, this summer to try to come up with some new questions and also update some of the trivia uh, questions that were in his, his 1996 book because uh, things change and some, <laughs> things have happened yeah, since then. Uh, we have uh, worked that together and um, it uh, we don't have a published date yet. We're working with the local publisher and it's not a great time in the publishing industry uh, for ex except for these kinds of books because so many of the museums and places around the state that have those kind of shops or don't have a lot of traffic these days. So we're trying to time the book to come out uh, when it'll get a good bang uh, when we release it. So hopefully knocking on wood when that might be later this year or, or soon. Right, because then wasn't weren't, um, wasn't that then also turned in, I think there was a board game of Arizona yeah, trivia. That's how, that's how it started was uh, uh, Mar one of Marshall's friends came up with a Arizona Trivial Pursuit game and he asked Marshall uh, the right uh, questions and of course, Marshall, the Arizona historian, knows so much about history, he probably dashed him off the top of his head, you know, in, in a couple of days. So the book has, you know, it's a 175 page book and it's just chock full of uh, great Arizona history questions. And, you know, uh, we've updated it and add some more uh, sports questions that some teams that weren't even around when in 1996 when he did his book. So I hope we can get it out there and I think people enjoy it. 
Yeah, no, I know it's like I'm I'm part of the Pioneer Cemetery in downtown Phoenix, and they end they used to end every meeting with a trivia question from Marshall Trimble. And so that was always kind of fun. And and by the way, uh, it was last week or the week before Marshall turned 82. And I hope he's, he's doing doing well. And uh, he's kind of uh, keeping close to home because of the health situation out there. So he's uh, he's really an Arizona treasure. Indeed he is. So happy he's around. Yep. And, and, and singing songs about Arizona. Yeah, he's a great entertainer. He's got all those cowboy songs. Indeed. So, Peter, thank you so much for being here. Oh, so how can people keep track of what you're doing and find out more about you? Well, uh, you start with the On the Road Arizona. And there's about uh, more than 60 pages of uh, stuff about Arizona towns, about uh, national parks and national monuments, state parks. Uh, there's uh, Best of Arizona, Best of Arizona Saloons. That's neon, lots of great stuff. I encourage you to go to there. And also if you go to uh, Facebook, if you go to, I have an On the Road Arizona page, which is some newer uh, blogs that I have and uh, some, some uh, stories that aren't on the, uh, on the website. So try both of those. I'm also on uh, Twitter at On Road Arizona, or you type that in, you'll, you'll find me on, on Twitter. I'm pretty active on there. And I try to I try to do links to uh, some of the pages on there. So please look me up and share anything you have, or contact me. I've uh, cannot contact um, on uh, on Arizona Arizona on the road Arizona page and ask questions or give me a lead on someplace out to see. Exactly, you know, because I mean, I find some of my best stuff actually comes from people just saying, "Hey, did you know this?" That's right. Yeah, and and. and when, when you're on Facebook, you, you know, get people, get people respond to the stories and say, did you know? And it's like, Oh my goodness. It's, it's crowdsourcing. It's just wonderful. Like you were talking earlier to get some more information on peso dollar and who knows, you probably uh, might, might score on that. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's like, and then discovering is like his son, Mark is now can kind of continuing and is still a musician. So it's like, Oh my gosh. And so I'm going to try and track down once venues are open again. Well, where is, Mark Dollar playing because that was yeah. actually his real name was Mark was pay was Dollar. That's great. Not not Peso. Peso was not his first name. I all, I could, all I could find was W O. So I don't know what W O stood for. Uh -huh. William somebody William Oscar or something. Right. I wonder if Mark has uh, old records of his father's that uh, might have some more of that twangy uh, sound. That uh, also Dwayne Eddy. Uh, from Coolidge was was famous for that. He had yes, he's actually the one that created that whole kind of that whole Western twang. Yeah. So yeah. So Peter, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You are welcome. I really enjoyed it, and I love what you do. And uh, you're the hip historian, and that's awesome. <laughs> thank you so much, Peter. Have a great rest of your night. All right, I'm gonna have a drink here. So good night. <laughs> Very good. Well, actually, you know, yeah. why don't we cheers each other? There you go. So cheers. There we go. Somewhere. All right. Thank you, Peter. Good night, everyone. Oh my gosh. That was so much fun. And you know, I just love all the stories about Arizona. So, you know, if, as you were starting to watch this, you didn't know what you were getting into and you thought, you know, I'm not going to click share because who knows what this show is going to be about. Well, hopefully now you've realized the value of why you should click share to just share this with all your friends as we just share the Arizona love. Because there are the stories of Arizona are endless. So our next segment is one and near and dear to my heart. Um, it is sponsored by the First Families of Arizona. You can track them down on Facebook under First Funds Arizona, or even their website, which is tffoa.org. And they just had a great program on kind of the Chinese history in Phoenix. And I love the fact that they're doing things on Zoom. So it's easy to attend their meetings. And they're always so informational. But this section is called Little Arizona. Now, as Peter mentioned, you know, publishing right now is kind of in a quandary. And so I was supposed to be working on a book called Little Arizona and it got pulled 
but I just got an email not long ago that we're kind of back on track. So we'll have to reestablish kind of publishing dates and all that. But a lot of people don't realize I grew up in a small town in the Midwest of about 25 people, two roads, one stop sign. And so even though I currently live in the fifth largest city in the country, although I haven't seen the new stats, so I don't know if we've gone up or down. So, but I kind of had that appreciation of being a city boy, but it also depends on the size of the city, whether it's 25 to millions, they all have something unique to share. And so tonight we're going to be talking about Parks, Arizona. And so, so Parks is basically kind of right smack dab in the middle between Williams and Flagstaff. Now, in the late 1890s, it started off as nothing more than a boxcar that had been turned into a depot that also had a post office in it. It then, for a short period of time, also became known as Maine. And primarily, it was there to really service the lumberjacks and the lumber industry that was thriving around there. In fact, at one point, they even had a sawmill. But you know what? A highway came through. And so you know what they did? They uprooted the town and moved it to the highway. And so that gave the town a whole new lease on life. And so this store was built in 1906. And it's still operating today. Now, it was owned by a gentleman whose last name was Park. So they indeed changed the name of the town to honor him. And so there you can see, I mean, that store, which is still open and serving people today. Now, it was funny when Peter brought me this town, I was like, oh, look, it's a little town on Route 66. And I was like, you know, what else can we find? And I was so excited to be able to find out that right next to that store is a little walking trail on old historic Route 66. Now you can drive through route to get there on Route 66, but now you can also take a little bit of a walk. Now to drive there, you actually go on the highest point of the entire Route 66. Now, back in the day, it was hard for so many of those cars that had been driven so hard to make it up that Brannigan Hill Park Pass. It's like 77,400 feet. And so Parks has even, a, you know, there is so much kind of quirky history out there. When you start looking, and I was found this photo of Andy Payne. So if you can imagine, you if you did that little walking bit of Route 66, you would not be the one and only person to have done that. Why, back in 1928, there was the International Transcontinental Foot Race, where people ran from LA to New York, and it was really to hype Route 66. And so they ran along Route 66. And so here is Andy Payne, who was Cherokee from Oklahoma, who actually wound up winning the race. And here is a photo of him running through Parks, Arizona. Now that onto itself is an amazing bit of history. There are books and at least one documentary that I've written about it. It's an amazing story. It also became known as the Bunyan Run because, you know, people didn't have the fancy sneakers like we have now. People were pretty much running in dress shoes. If you can imagine running that distance in dress shoes. Now, also, as you're leaving town, you might come across the Grand Canyon Deer Farm, which would be a great place to see deer just kind of lounging right now in the snow. But, you know, they are not just deer. They also have peacocks, llamas, wallabies, and buffalo that you can see about 15 miles from Parks, Arizona. I've never been there, but you know, once we're able to travel, that's on my bucket list of places to go. Now, coming up next week, we have the George Washington Carver 
Cultural Center and Museum are going to be on talking about the museum and kind of that black segregation here in Arizona. So that should be a really interesting show. If you've never had a chance to see the school or go through it, I used to drag students from ASU, buy it, talk about the history, and even taking a few school groups back when I was in the library in South Phoenix through there. So and remember, if you have stories, questions, suggestions, please throw them out to me via email. So that way we have things to follow up on. That's always fun. I've actually had people like send me things going, hey, you know, do you know any story about this? And so I've brought it to the group before. So if you have any little oddities that you would like more information on, please share that. Now you can track me down on Facebook, Instagram, and email. I am on Twitter, but unlike Peter, I haven't figured Twitter out as well as he has. So I don't really do Twitter that much yet. I think there may be a plan in place where that may be changing. And don't forget, we have our second Saturday tour coming up. Um, the 13th of February is sold out for a birthday party, but we do indeed have folks coming in March as well. And we are fully masked. So as we end this evening, I always love to give a shout out to Cole and Chris who did the, Cole wrote the music as well as Chris did the video, as well as always PJ, another home run on the cocktail. Our outro music is a mix of found, fo found film footage from Arizona as well as Mr. Ho, who has his own orchestratica up in, he's now on the East Coast, but he grew up right here in Sunny Slope. So everyone have a great rest of your night and I will see you next week, same bat time, same bat channel, as we get a chance to talk about Carver's, the Carver School. <laughs>